Well, I think I'd lost myself in the search for love, right? I'd really felt like I'd I'd had this amazing, incredible humanitarian career. And then I came back to New York and I was so single-minded about meeting someone because I felt I had to meet someone by a certain point. And I just, I didn't like who I was becoming because it was so, it wasn't really who I authentically was. It was like being so ambitious about it and so focused and then like letting everything else that was rich in my life kind of fall to the side. So I think that that was when I realized, when I stopped liking myself and I was like, God, my conversations are really uninteresting. I mean, I like lived in Ethiopia and here I'm like talking about guys all the time. It's like so boring. And my best friend actually told me that she's like, you know, that's all you talk about now. And I'm like, Oh yeah. So when I decided to give it up, I think it was more, who am I? I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Natasha, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it is my pleasure to have you here. So I actually found out about your work uh, through both our mutual literary agent, Lisa Demona, and I, I believe that somebody on your team sent me your book. And at first I was kind of like man fast. I'm like, what the hell am I going to have in common with this person? And what's interesting about this? And then I remember picking up the book and I think I probably read the whole thing in one sitting because uh, I was so intrigued by so much of what you were saying. And I remember I emailed you and said, oh my God, I didn't think I would relate to this as a guy, but this is, is really mind blowing. But before we get into all of that, uh, one thing that I've <clears throat> gathered from reading the book is that your mother has had a profound impact on your life. And what I wonder is what is one of the most important things that she taught you growing up that have influenced who you've shaped, who you've become and what you've done with your life? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I definitely feel like both of my parents have impacted me, but of course my mom is like one of the main characters in the book and everyone like you know, she says the most outlandish things. So people just love her. My editor was like, we need more of her, more, more, more. But growing up, um, you know, she, we, she was very strict and, um, she was always teaching us to, she was, she was like, I don't know. She never put pressure on us in terms of like school and, um, you know, what we needed to accomplish or achieve, but she was very much about respecting our elders. And, you know, we weren't allowed to kind of mess around at a restaurant. You know, I see a lot of kids doing that. Like we were just, we were so well behaved. So she had this kind of, um, like almost old fashioned approach to parenting. I mean, there's no spanking or anything like that, but it was like, you do not mess around with mom, like dad, you could get Mm -hmm. away with stuff. And so she just really, uh, taught us, you know, that, that notion of respecting, respecting others, respecting the elders. Um, you know, and just, she's taught me so much. I mean, she's one of the most generous people I've ever met. Like she would give her last meal away. Um, she's mm-hmm. incredibly generous. Like if, you know, we're at a restaurant with a group of people, she will always reach for the tab or, or give the waiter the credit card beforehand. Um, so generosity is something else that she's really, I hope I learned from her because I think it's such a great quality. And I do believe that the more you give, the more you receive. And she does it, you know, not because she believes that, but just because it, it, she loves to do it, right? She's just a giver. You know how there's givers and takers in life? So she's yeah. definitely a giver to, to a fault sometimes I would say. Um, but yeah, I mean, gosh, the list is so long in terms of what she's taught me. I couldn't, couldn't possibly sum it up in a couple sentences. Yeah. I'd imagine. Well, I think that one of the things that is really fascinating to me about your story is that you have this sort of dichotomy of cultures, right? Your mother is Indian, your dad is not. And what I wanted I really wondered as I was going through this is is what are the differences between the way you grew up and probably what you know of what I grew up uh like how much of each culture was infused into the way that your parents raised you and then also like what aspects of culture did your mom preserve and how did she do it yeah I mean I think my mom is a very Americanized Indian um she's been here longer than she lived in India right she moved here when she was almost 20 So, but then there were so many traditions and there was this mindset that, that, you know, she grew up with that never went away. She still has it. Like there's shame, for example, around, uh, you know, sexuality, like if, or, you know, there's a lot of that, that she still holds onto, or it's just been ingrained in her. But I would say, but both my parents, I think I had 50, 50 in terms of, 
um, you know, what our household was like. I, you know, we would have Indian food every night because we had a, a nanny who cooked Indian food because that's what my mom had wanted. And, you know, we all liked it. And then on the weekends, we'd have like spaghetti and meatballs. So it was like the American side. And um, there, there was a good balance, but I would say that my mom was kind of, um, you know, she was the one who wore the pants per se in the, in the, in the house, in the home environment, which, you know, suited my dad was fine. He's, he's, he was very, um, accommodating and wasn't, you know, one of those guys that was like, you know, I, it's my way or the highway. So, um, but I grew up with, I think both cause he, you know, his, you know, her relatives would come as Indian relatives it, do they st- would stay for months at a time and you know <laughs> it's like are, mom yeah. do they move in with us like are they you know I was such a are they leaving anytime <laughs> soon <laughs> what yeah I was like what are they are- doing like are they but and then you know my my dad would have family come but they would like come and go like you know but we'd have like you know her brother would come and stay for months and months and um and now in retrospect I wish I'd been more interested and in, and in knowing about their background and partition because they were even older than my mom. So they remembered, you know, the history of India, right? The partition of India, which happened in 1947, as you know. But I think that if I'd had two Indian parents, um, I think it would have been different, right? That would have been, um, you know, I, I would have become a doctor, I guess. <laughs> That's the one thing. My mom always wanted me to have like a very like traditional safe career, like to work uh-huh. for the government or to be a, a you know, a doctor or a lawyer, like there weren't that many options. So when I'm like, yeah, I'm kind of freelancing and I have a, I mean, she's finally like accepted that that's how I am though. I did for a while work at the UN, as you know, for 10 years. Um, and of course she loved that. So when I left, she was like, Oh my God, it was like the worst thing you could do. And as I say in my Mm -hmm. book, she's like, you know, when you, you turn 40, people won't want to hire you, which I'm like, where do you get this from? Um, but so there is that kind of pressure. And I, I don't know if you experienced this, but like, oh, you know, I can, security. I can relate. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was with my parents the other night and they were, we were having dinner. They, we have dinner every Sunday and they, you know, they, we got around to talking about relationships and, you know, they said, look, are you open to meeting anybody we'll introduce you to? I said, yeah, I'll meet anybody you want me to meet as long as they're in California, as long as I get to see a picture of them first. Mm-hmm. And then I posed a question to my mom. I said, what are you going to tell them about what I do for work? And my mom kind of freaked and she was like, oh my God, you're right. And then my dad is like, oh, I guess we'll have to tell them that you have a business, but your income is unstable. I was like, you're kind of underselling me here, man. <laughs> like, I was like, you left out the fact that I've written two books with a publisher, you know, uh, and, you know, we just raised a round of funding. And my mom, of all the things she could have suggested, she's like, don't get mad. She said, but have you thought about a part time job? I was like, are you fucking kidding me? That's, well, uh, that's so typical, but, right? It's just. Yeah. After all this, 10 years, two books, you know, a round of funding from an investor and she suggested a part-time job. Yeah, you are a success, but they they see, you know, success through a different lens, right? Um, uh-huh. It's like a stable job and they're just from a different generation. And I think that yeah. we're definitely not alone in, in feeling this way. I think, yeah, my dad, it's funny because my mom was always obsessed with me meeting someone and getting married and settling down. And, you know, I remember I've had had a couple of setups. This was like 10 years ago. Um, through family, friends, and the very awkward meetings at like a country club where you're just like, oh, yeah. this is not happening. And then my dad was always like, you know, you can go. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. He's like, You'll, love will find you when, you know, when you're ready, mm-hmm. when it's meant to happen. He was so laid back about it. My mom was always like um, a little more focused on it. I was like, now that I'm yeah. matched and, you know, settled, you, you should just be, start your own matchmaking business. Cause she just loves it. And I think it's like probably, you know, something that runs in, in her genes, right? <laughs> because, you know, well, you're I, famous for being matchmakers. Well, I, it's funny because at my sister's wedding, you know, I gave a speech where I literally put a phone number, a, a slide of my phone number on the screen and said, for all the aunties who want to know when I'm getting married, you're free to text profiles, pictures, and all other relevant information to this number. That's so and funny. <laughs> none of them did a damn thing. You know, I'm like, it's six months later. And so far, you know, I told one of my friends, I was like, these are the worst unpaid employees in the world. They should all be fired. <laughs> yeah, but you probably, uh, I don't know that you would like who they suggest. I mean, yeah, exactly. there's always, it's just, it's such a, you know, because I, when I was in New York, obviously I write about this in ManFast, but I went to a matchmaker. Um, you know, I did a couple different matchmaking kind of um, 
I, I, I guess just stints and they were very bizarre dates for sure. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and I think men have to pay money. I I didn't pay anything, but I remember this guy and I don't want to name names, but I mean, you know, I was 34 at the time. I just moved back to the U S and I'm like, all right, let me just get focused on meeting someone and having a baby. And, you know, he said that there were only like two men who would fathom dating me because of my age, my dinosaur age, right? He was like, you know, you're at a turning point um, because, you know, you're going to turn 35 is a turning point age for women. And you know, a lot of these men want to have children and they want to date someone in their twenties. And I remember it being so profoundly sexist and just disturbing. And I was like, mm-hmm. went home and cried to my pillow. And then I wrote a blog about it that got, went viral, but um, <laughs> I didn't name him. I could have, but I mean, it was just, yeah. The whole, I mean, I think ultimately, I mean, not that I don't think that you can meet someone online, but Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've had a positive experience with these matchmakers, but I think that it's such a personal thing. Like there's so much that goes into it that you can't just put two profiles together. Um, You know, my fiance, he's, I would never have met him because on my dating app, I was using Hinge. Um, mm-hmm. I had the minimum height as being, um, six, <laughs> one and also like maximum age being 40 and mm-hmm. but he's much older than that. And he's like five, eight. So, you know, I just w- wouldn't have met him. And so mm-hmm. in some ways, I mean, I just feel, I don't know. I always wanted to meet someone organically. So, yeah. Well, it's, you know, so I've had the matchmaking experience as, as part of some documentary that will be out on Netflix next year. Oh, great. I remember, uh, I remember the, the first conversation I had with the matchmaker and she had asked all these things about careers and all this other shit. And I said, lady, I'm not hiring somebody for a job here. <laughs> you know, right. it was like, she was looking for a resume. You just like, what do you want on somebody's resume? I was like, have you actually read my profile? I'm like, do I look like a person who would make assessments based on that? Uh, yeah, I, I found the experience just kind of appalling, to yeah, be honest. I, don't, um, I would be surprised if anyone actually meets through those agencies. And you know, I found the guys really bizarre. Hmm. <laughs> but that was just my experience. Well, you know, I, I think that there's something, one, one of my, my favorite lines from the book, uh, and there are two things I wanted to ask you about here. I remember you refer to your mother by first name in the book throughout the book. And this was what the first thing I underlined, I remember was this. You said, Pramila lives in an imaginary world where handsome celebrity tennis stars are easy to come by or a Nora Ephron movie where good looking people bump into each other at the tops of skyscrapers or in bars when they're at least expecting it. That had actually been her reality. And I, I don't think she's alone as far as Indian moms go. <laughs> uh, but I, I wanted to ask you about that. Like, um, is, it, is there a reason that she's referred to constantly by first name throughout the book? And uh, also, you know, what is it like dealing with that reality, uh, particularly, you know, being a girl who had not gotten married by the age that a typical Indian mom expects her to? Yeah. Um, well, I actually referred to her by first name and that's not her real name. It's similar okay. to her real name, but just to um, make it easy because I felt like mom, mom, mom didn't, I don't know why it didn't sound right when I was writing. Um, and that was a name that Pramila was a name that we'd seen a fortune teller in India and the woman was like, you should have been named Pramila because then you would have been very, very lucky. And so I just remembered that. So I, I used, yeah. obviously I changed everyone's names in the book, but um, it's true. I mean, mom, she has been exposed to both Bollywood and Hollywood, which can have, you know, a real mm-hmm. impact on people. And um, she's very like romantic. I'm like, this, these are fictional movies. I mean, these, this is not real life, but because yeah. we met my dad on Valentine's day in a bar and it was kind of love at first sight. And like, he was the first man she was really with, um, you know, and she was in her early twenties. She never actually had to date. Like, I think she went on like three mm-hmm. dates before she met my dad. So, you know, he, she just doesn't understand the kind of experience that I've had, the grueling experience that I've had the last, you know, two decades, right. Because it came to mm-hmm. her so easily. So when I'm like, she's like, I just think you're not hanging out in the right places. I'm like, mom, I've been all over the world in every city and every bar I've been, you know, I've done everything surfed here and there. And I, I mean, it's just like, you know, I mentioned, cause we were talking about surfing earlier, but it's just like, yeah. I, it's not like I just go to bars. I go to, you know, events and things like that. And I'm like, it just, you know, I don't know. I mean, it just hasn't happened yet. And so eventually she kind of didn't get, get, give up, but you know, I think she just stopped putting the pressure on me because she could 
tell that I would get a little frustrated. But yes, she's obsessed with Roger Federer. And that's a recurring kind of mention in the book, as you've noticed. I'm like, I'm not going to yeah. marry a famous tennis star who's already married, by the way, with multiple children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you look, I, I can, I can part, I think part of why I, I, I highlighted that was because I've had many of those conversations with my own mom, like some of which have ended in like, just, you know, shouting matches. Um, <laughs> but she kind of backed off for a while, but there's an, you know, one other thing you said here is like any other woman who grew up on a gargantuan non-paleo diet of rom-coms, which included both Hollywood and Bollywood, I assumed everlasting romantic love would find me eventually. I don't think that's isolated to just women. I think that I was under the impression that that's what things would go like for a very long time until a friend convinced me that this is a bullshit version of how this happens. He said, you're living in a delusional Disney movie fantasy of how dating is going to go. He said, you're not going to just meet the first girl on Bumble and have her magically fall in love with you. He's like, you're probably going to have to go on a lot of dates. And, but that goes so counter to so much of our cultural programming. And so I wonder, you know, how do you navigate that landscape? Or more, more importantly, how do you actually do what normal people would do in spite of this, you know, deeply embedded programming? Well, I think there's different types of love, right? Like, I mean, there's the infatuation and there's passion and then there's like real love that like kind of, I think it's more something that grows and develops like as you deepen in a relationship and um, go through experiences together, both positive and harrowing. And Mm -hmm. I've experienced that because I've been, you know, with someone for a year and so much has happened to us in just that year. And it's just, I can see how, how much it's changed from that kind of first, that chemistry to like literally being pregnant two months later until like moving in together and having a baby and, you know, being stung by a scorpion and having all these, you know, various things happen to us over the last several months. Um, I, I just noticed that it's a deeper love that's not breathless though. And so I think, you know, when we expect to meet someone and feel this kind of breathless love for him or her forever, I think that's unrealistic. I mean, that's just in my experience. Um, I mean, I think it kind of comes and goes those emotions. Um, Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's not that we should lower our expectations, but know that love is, it's just such a different, it's, there's infatuation. There's the the love that's like the truth and being with someone who shares your vision of the world, who you can be your authentic self with, who understands Mm -hmm. you, um, who supports you and your, your dreams. I mean, I think those are the things that are important to look for, right. As opposed to that, that feeling that we, you know, we see in Hollywood films that love at first Mm -hmm. sight. It's like, is this person aligned with who I am and who I want to become? Because ultimately, you know, you want to spend time with someone who's going to help you continue on your path and vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I I, I think that, you know, uh, I I remember reading the book Attached, and I I actually recently wrote about this in in a piece about, you uh, you know, what a professional poker player taught me about decisions. And we're talking about sort of long distance relationships and one that blew up in my face. But one of the things that always struck me from that book was that, you know, it was kind of like people who have an anxious attachment style tend to fall hard and fast for people. And I was like, I hate that. I'm like, I hate that this is me. But they're like, the way to mitigate that is to keep your options open. But I think the other sort of lesson I took from that was we're so quick to basically assume our first impression is the right one. And, you know, I, I realized, I was like, oh, you don't really know what somebody is like until you actually spend a significant amount of time with them. Yeah. And, and go through a really grueling experience as well, because then you see the mm-hmm. colors and like, you know, yeah. and I, and I feel like I went through a kind of a grueling childbirth experience recently. And I, I saw a different side to my partner and like a really great one. Like I felt like, wow, like he, you know, it was, it was like three days of laboring and all this drama and, you know, um, he just was there and in such an, an amazing way that I hadn't seen him come through because we hadn't been faced with these challenges yet. And like, it was like, wow. So it's almost like it's all a process of discovery. You're always learning about that person and seeing their potential and, and they're also growing with you. And then like, of course we bring out certain sides and certain people. Right. And that's why it's important to like, feel like whoever with is like bringing out our best and not our worst because we have both. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and that's where the compatibility kind of, kind of comes in. Cause you know, I think people get in relationships and, or, you know, that just don't, that, that they end and they end perhaps badly or divorce and stuff. But I also think that that is, 
that's all part of our spiritual growth, right? Because you learn so much when you're with someone and, and all that mm-hmm. kind of, um, I don't know, um, that heartbreak, it's, that's all yeah. lessons. It just teaches you and deepens you and it makes you readier for the next relationship. And, you know, I had a lot of heartbreak before I actually really committed to someone. And, and, you know, the attached thing is interesting because I think I had the opposite problem that I, I was a commitment phobe. You know, mm-hmm. I loved my freedom and I loved traveling and I felt like you couldn't have that and be with someone. But, you know, I had yeah. these weird ideas that I just held on to, which weren't even, you know, accurate. Um, and so finally, when I kind of shed all that on my man fast, which is part of what I was doing, I realized, mm-hmm. you know, I just started looking at things in a totally different way. Yeah. Yeah. I think that there's a, you know, um, another part of the book where you talk about the death of your father and you say that if the death of a parent doesn't call everything into question, then I don't know what will darkness. It turned out would be my ultimate teacher. The Buddhists consider suffering to be the ultimate gateway to awakening. And mine had brought me to a crossroads of sorts. So take me there, take me through that experience and how you navigate the grief of something as difficult as losing a parent. Because I, I think that one of the things that has become very apparent to me as as I've gone through building on Mystical Creative, we had a guy named Frank Ostaseski here, who's the director of the Zen Hospice Project. And I remember telling him, I said, you know, Frank, I'm no longer afraid of being alone. I'm afraid that one of both of my parents won't be there to see milestone moments in my life, like having kids or getting married. And that was what convinced me to start going home for Sunday, you know, every Sunday for dinner. So I wonder how you navigate something like that, knowing that this sort of future that you had imagined is not going to happen. Yeah. I mean, yeah, as I, I wrote the same, you know, I was had the same emotions. Like I wanted my dad to meet my child and he hasn't and won't. Um, it's hard. I'm, I'm not going to lie, but I, I guess, you know, interestingly, I was like putting all this pressure on myself, but he never was like, I want you to get married and have kids. He was just, he actually was so supportive of my career. You know, I was an aid worker for the UN. I bounced around a lot and it was just very exciting. And even though it was kind of nerve wracking for my parents when I was like posted in Pakistan or, you know, on the Tunisia, Libya border, um, they were like, or my dad, at least he was like, wow, you've just got such an incredible life. So um, it's almost like he was living vicariously through me and I comfort myself in knowing that he got to have, you know, experience the life that I had sort of through my, you know, sharing with him what that was like, as opposed to me just having kids, you know, early on and not really pursuing my dreams. So, um, you know, it, it, it is heartbreaking and how you navigate grief when a parent dies. I don't have the answers to that. I mean, I share everything that I could possibly share within reason in the book, um, you know, just the ups and downs of it. And I think that there's no right way to grieve there's and there's mm. no um timeline really because i think you're always i'll always be grieving in some way but it's i definitely feel it's more manageable than it was right after that um yeah and i and but i know my brother has also had his own different experience of grieving over my dad and i've noticed we're kind of on different journeys different timelines and um but i do think it's very important to process the grief instead of to, um, you know, it's, it's easy to kind of just shut it out or try to with, you know, a lot of people, Mm -hmm. you know, turn to drugs and alcohol. Um, and, and it's not even grief over losing a loved one, grief over so many things like the end of a relationship. People often like try to numb themselves. Um, And they're done that. Yes, exactly. And I think it's, it's actually a lot more common than we, we are aware. And I think that's part of the man fast originally. It wasn't even, going to be about this, but was to really just face it head on and to like, let myself cry. And I just felt, as I said, in the book, I didn't feel like New York was a place that I could unravel in necessarily. Mm. New York is a place where you have to like pound the pavement to make ends meet, or at least it was for me, um, to make mm. rent, to, you know, and it's just fast, fast, fast. And, um, you know, I think the book, I often describe it as a journey of mindfulness around grief and what is that, mm. what does loss mean and what does it teach us? And how can I move forward, um, even though I will be suffering and how, you know, what would my dad want for me? Um, you know, but like my brother's doing a show on psychics. He, he works, he's a producer and, um, he worked at Discovery, National Geographic. And now he, um, some mediums have been coming to him and my dad has been speaking to him apparently through these mediums, which has been interesting because I've heard some of the audio 
Um, you know, and it's like he, he, the man whose name begins with M who died of a lung disease. Um, he knows about the July birthday, which is when I had my baby. So it's just like stuff like that. You're like, Oh my God, it kind of blows your mind. And you want to believe it. Cause you want to believe that, you know, when someone dies, no. it doesn't just end there. Right. And I don't actually believe that it does. I don't know what happens, but I, I, you know, we're energetic bodies. I just think the physical yeah. person is not there anymore. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. well, it's funny. Cause I know you, you, you know, in quotes, put the word new age bullshit at least once in your book, which I've often termed a good amount of this kind of stuff. But at the same time, I think there are moments that, you know, we have in our lives that make us realize there are things that we will never be able to explain or understand. And as a person who's incredibly driven by ration and wants every mm-hmm. single guest I have here to back up their stories with, with science, sometimes I have to like surrender to the, the idea that, okay, wait, we don't have explanations for a lot of things. Yeah. I mean, we don't, we don't know anything about the universe. I mean, honestly, and, and I think that yeah. it's, um, arrogant for us to think that we know that's why I, religion really bothers me because it's just like, none of this is proven. None of this, you know, it's just, yeah. don't even get me started on religion. I don't know why I brought it up, but I mean, all we know is that we just don't know, but we have our own individual, we have our own intuition around things. And so much, uh-huh. and this is a writer, you know, I'm saying this, but a lot of it just can't be communicated in like words. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, it's, it's just hard to communicate some of the most profound um, spiritual experiences that we have. I mean, I sort of attempted to in the book, but I, I just didn't get anywhere where I would have wanted to go. Right. I just mm. did my best, but it's like, you know what, I'm going to take the pressure off because some of this is just so out there. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that that makes a, a perfect segue to, to ask you about this sentence. You said, I decided to try to let go of whatever I thought my life was supposed to be and let it live out the way it felt like living itself out without all the constraints and measurements I'd lined up against it. And I read that and I thought to myself, how, <laughs> you know, like not only how do you do that, but, um, because I don't think that these sort of expectations that you have of your life are just your expectations are also the expectations of a mother. So how, one, what has been your mom's reaction to the way all of this has turned out and how do you let go of what you thought your life was supposed to be? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I think, um, I was fed up. Right. And I think, I think as a woman, there's even more pressure because we have the biological clock and it's like, Oh my yeah. God, Oh my God. If you're in your mid thirties and you want to have a family, you got to do it now and you have it but you don't want to settle into it. And it's just all this pressure from the media, um, from other people, other circles, like, um, you know, you don't want to be a spinster. Whereas a man, if he stays single, like for decades, he's like a bachelor and it's kind of a hot and sexy thing to be, but a woman's a spinster. Of course, this is changing, but it's like still a negative thing. If a woman is single without a fan, I mean, now it's, it is changing. People, women have embraced it, not only in the West, but also in India, um, you know, there are women who are choosing to stay single and not, you know, do the whole traditional get married and have a family thing, though it's still not as widely accepted as one would want it to be. But I was just done. I was like, you know, I tried everything. I went on dating apps. I, I, I did everything. And now I'm just, maybe I'm not ready. Maybe I don't really want it. Maybe I'm trying to fit into this mold that I don't fit into. Right. And why, why is it so important that I marry and have kids and why? And I just sort of just I was like, let me see what my life would be like if I just gave up men. And that's kind of how I started out on the man fast, like, and just focus on myself and how would I make myself, how would I make my life really complete and um, satisfying in the absence of a romantic relationship? And so it was like, you know, deep in my um, participation in various communities and really invest in my friendships and invest in the creative arts and start writing. And then I end up writing the book. And then, um, you know, there's so much other stuff that can enrich our lives that go beyond just a romantic relationship. And that's why I also talk about the Greeks, you know, they have so many different names for love, right? We just focus on romantic love often, but they had, you know, so many different, the friendship love, spiritual love. Um, you know, they had like so many names for love and we just focus on one kind of love, but that's not, that's not, you know, necessarily the best kind of love. Right. I mean, it's not Mm -hmm. a competition, but there's so much else to be grateful for. There's love between friends, et cetera. So anyway, I just threw it all to the wind. I was like, and mom was, she was just, you know, she knew that, I mean, I don't know if she gave up, but she was just like knowing, you know, I think that's a great 
parenting kind of tactic, like letting your child be who she needs to be. She just let mm-hmm. me do, she kind of backed off and was like, you know, she knew I was grieving over my dad and she just was like, all right, she needs to go do this. So not once did I feel like she wasn't supporting me on this like, you know, nine month travel spiritual journey. Um, I mean, of uh, course, I know she would have preferred that if I'd stayed at the UN with a pension and all of that. But I think she also ultimately, because she, I think, has changed and grown a lot as well. She understood that it was like essential to my happiness and development as a human. And of course, when I gave up on all of that, um, I really, and I, and you're not going to like this term, but I don't know what else to use. But it, it, I did come to this sort of place of self love, which is why, uh, well, I don't want to get, this would be a spoiler alert, but why the book ends the way that it does. Because ultimately, yeah. you know, as Ram Das says, we're all just walking each other home, right? And home is, you know, inside of us, right? So that was kind of what the whole nine months was about. And that's why I liken it to, um, you know, pregnancy, right? Because I was like rebirthing myself and kind of shedding all this stuff around, like you have to be married and you have to be with this kind of person. And, you know, and of course I did some scandalous things. So once my mom found out about the lesbian relationship, she was just like, oh my God. <laughs> and I mean, you can imagine how hard that was telling yeah. an Indian parent. It was very hard. Yeah. I, I was going to ask you about that. I was like, well, I wonder what that conversation went like. It was not something that I would want to, you know, replay, <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, but it happened and, and we didn't really, you know, there's again, there's shame around that, but it love is love, yeah. right? Whether who cares what gender so I think that's been some um, growth for her. But of course, she's very happy that I ultimately am with a male doctor, <laughs> which is like, yeah. you know, and that's not because she wants it for me, but it's just what happened, right? Um, uh-huh. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. So I think there were, there's another thing here you talk about, right? You said, given the choice between freedom and security, freedom would always win with me. Slowing down and reaching for freedom can be surprisingly scary because it opens up a space in which we fully emerge, whether we mean to consciously or not. We can fear the truth of ourselves, the power we have. We're afraid that wielding that power will transform the way we know ourselves to be. Our identities demand new visions for the landscape of our lives, and it will. It changes who we were becoming or had planned to become how do you deal with that fear? Uh, and how do you, how do you navigate this landscape despite the fear? Yeah. I mean, you can only deal with it once you actually take that risk and you, you make that jump and that leap. Right. And, um, you know, Marion Williamson talks a lot about that fearing that our own power. And I think it's so true because every time people, Oh my God, you've lived the most amazing life. You've done some, and I'm like, well, it's only because I, I had the courage to write courage is a word I love because it stems from the word core, which is, you know, heart, right? So I'm like living with heart because my heart didn't want to do a desk job anymore. So I'm like, I'm going to do this. Right. And, um, I just think there are a lot of people who are really unhappy in their particular environments, whether it be in a relationship or in a job or whatever. And they just, but they're, they're stuck in it because they don't see an alternative or they're too f- afraid of like leaving and seeing, you know, and of the unknown. Right. So mm-hmm. I think there's so many people and I always tell them like, well, just do it. I mean, of course there's some people who have financial obligations. I mean, I, I think I was just lucky in that. I mean, I didn't have much of a savings when I quit my UN job. Of course I found a, a contract that could like give me some income when I was doing this. But honestly, I just, I just was like, I need to do this more than I need to stay in a job and make money. Right. It was like, this is so primal to me. There was no, no. Right. And I think eventually, and that's why people have midlife crises at a certain point, they're just like, 
you've got to tend to whatever it is that's like hankering to get out of you or whatever you need to do. Um, so, but I think that people are afraid of, of change, right? Even if they're uncomfortable and unhappy, um, they, they're more afraid of change and not knowing what's next. But I've always like thrived on not knowing what's next. Cause I think that's what makes life exciting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So to me, the, there's this point of frustration in the book where uh, I, I think I related to this so much because I, I, I felt like this even as an Indian guy. And, uh, you know, I think my sister had felt like this at uh, up until about a year ago. You know, I, I mean, that was the, the best thing about my sister getting married was that nobody bothered me for two years. It was like... <laughs> Good. We've got something that is taking up so much of our time and attention. And even, you know, a couple of months ago, my parents were like, by the way, this thing was really expensive. So if you take your time, cool, we're good with that. That's hysterical. <laughs> oh my God. I love it. Um, but you said, you know, for an unmarried woman, I'm now considered downright ancient by Indian standards. This is a huge relief as I don't have to face any more ad hoc introductions to putatively eligible Indian men by extended family members. And then you say, perhaps I'd receive my quota of love for this lifetime if there was such a thing and I was being greedy by expecting more when some people hadn't even had any and it cut because I wanted to have the fairy tale romance my parents had or nothing at all, nothing blah or mediocre. And I was only slowly starting to realize not everyone gets that. Not everyone gets to meet a conscious, heart-centered, emotionally astute and spiritually advanced person and wed them. And so, you know, I, I wonder when you're at that point of frustration, uh, like, you know, it's funny because if you told a guy go on a, uh, you know, a woman fast, he'd be like, yeah, I'm doing that involuntarily at moments anyways. Uh, so I wonder, you know, like when you get to that point of frustration, like what are the decisions you make about your life? Yeah. Well, and it's funny that you mentioned that about people saying, oh, I'm already on a fast. I'm like, yes, but that's because you're just like, oh, men are, you know, men are awful. And I just don't want to, you know, there's no one out there, but it's like, no, I'm, when I, describe my man fast. It's like a conscious spiritual fast, kind of like Ramadan. Like you're really doing this. You're eliminating, knowing that just by stripping that thing out of your life, you can kind of get recalibrate yourself. Right. So not just, Oh, there's no one around, but like consciously, like removing all the dating headaches, et cetera. So you can like invest in your own personal growth and well being and fill it up with other things that are really nourishing because I think that dating can be very demoralizing for both genders. Um, absolutely. I mean, I can only know from my perspective, but I know I, I've spoken to a lot of men and they, they go through the same thing I and mean, no one wants to get rejected and people get tired of going on these dates. And, um, you know, and I think that I think, well, I mean, it's true. I was really frustrated. And, you know, when I think about India, I mean, everyone's old, <laughs> So when I go home, they're just now that I'm like engaged, it's a different story. But like, I think the last couple trips, you know, when I was there, they were just like, she's just a Western woman who's career focused. And they kind of just gave up, right? Because you know, the, the, the most um, motivated matchmaker was my mom's sister, who I used to stay with in Bombay. And of course, she passed away. But, um, you know, I she was really... Um, dear to me. And she, but she was really funny. And she's like, you need to marry someone with health, wealth, wisdom, character, and education. And I was like, okay, I had this list in my head. I mean, she told me that when I was like nine years old. So I just, the, you know, the pressure from, and she never married. She's like, I've decided to be a career woman, but she also had like such high standards too. Um, so it's kind of interesting that she didn't marry and she had this very exciting life with Air India. She was doing PR and traveling all over with the prime minister. And, um, but yeah, I guess I'm rambling a little bit, but I, I think I was frustrated and I thought maybe it's just not in the cards for everyone. And I'm like, but I also was like, well, I've had so much love in my life, like from my parents, from my friends, like my niece, you know, it was like that I should be satisfied with, satisfied with just that. Right. It's, um, you know, maybe I don't need more. Maybe if I could just have some gratitude for all the love that I do have, um, that would be enough. And of course, once you are grateful for something, then that tends to reap more. But I wasn't doing it because I wanted more, but just like, why can't I just acknowledge that I have so many beings in my life who are so incredibly supportive and amazing? So I, it was, that was kind of after the frustration, I started to look at what I did have instead of what I didn't have, which is what I think is really important. Um, yeah. in terms of just changing our mindsets and be, you're not going to meet someone or, you know, 
be of interest to people if you're not in a positive space. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think that you speaking of space, I think this is really where I wanted to take this next is, you know, filling that space now, like you decide, okay, that's it. I'm going to go out and manifest. It's making me wonder like, oh, what would happen if I just said, you know what? I'm not even going to bother trying for a month. Like I'm going to put my energy into or a couple of months like, and see what happens. Um, it, I think that to me, that was, you know, one of the things, and you actually said, you know, when we become conscious, aware of our surroundings, aware of ourselves on a deeper level, we connect with flow. I would wake up feeling like the only person awake in the world. And then when I settled into it, I'd feel like everything was awake inside of me. And, um, uh, I think that I wonder, you know, when you basically say, okay, you know what, I'm done with men for a while. Um, Like, what did you fill that space with? And and what is the sort of spiritual journey that you went on that kind of brought you to where you're at? Yeah. Well, I think I'd lost myself in the search for love, right? I'd, I'd really felt like I'd, I'd had this amazing, incredible humanitarian career. And then I came back to New York and I was so single-minded about meeting someone because I felt I had to meet someone by a certain point. And I just, I didn't like who I was becoming because it was so, it wasn't really who I authentically was. It was like being so, um, you know, ambitious about it and so focused and then like letting everything else that was rich in my life kind of, um, fall to the side. So I just, um, I think that that was when I realized when I stopped liking myself and I was like, God, my conversations are really uninteresting. I mean, I like lived in Ethiopia and here I'm like, talking about guys all the time. It's like so boring. And my best friend actually told me that she's like, you know, that's all you talk about now. And I'm like, Oh yeah. So when I, when I decided to give it up, I think it was more, who am I? Like I wanted to go back to, to the self, which I also felt like as amazing as my career had been, like it was just nonstop, right. Doing, being an aid worker in emergencies. I never really had time to process anything. Like all the, the grief I'd seen and, you know, disaster zones and Haiti and all these places. And I just wanted to like have that spaciousness. So that was a big theme in the book, right? Just getting that space to process, which I know is a luxury because most of us can't just go off for several months, but apparently you can go off for a few weeks, but just having even a little bit of space in our lives to like, just, you know, and, and, and meditation, of course, is at the forefront of my mind, of course, just sitting, you know, and people make a meditation so complicated, but I'm like, can you just sit in stillness with yourself? and just be present. Um, it's really, that's all that it is. It's not anything that complicated, right? I mean, we're, we know how to do it. Um, it's like innate to us. Like it's what our ancestors did, you know, no matter where we were from, but of course with both of us being Indian, like we invented meditation, like it should be easy for us. Even, you know, you say you like surfing, it's a moving meditation, right? When you don't think about any, um, but I think also for me in terms of just the spiritual journey, being in nature. And and it's interesting. My dad was a nature lover too. And I just felt like very drawn to nature. So, you know, every place that I was in, in the book, pretty much every place that I was attracted to, and I didn't plan this months in advance at all. Like I said, I was just kind of going to flow, but like Kerala, super lush and jungly, and there's the ocean. And then I was in Sicily working on on a farm essentially, and just getting my hands dirty, which is what my body just wanted after living in New York city for so long. And then, um, you know, where else was I? I was in Tanzania. I was in this just kind of raw, beautiful landscape. Um, and anything I was attracted to during that year was just very nature focused. I just wanted to be in nature. And I feel like nature is such a powerful, um, ally in terms of just getting it. It's easier to like stay present when you're in nature. It's also super healing. Um, and there's just that, that silence that you, you know, when I was working on Mount Etna, it's just like amazing. I just, I felt like I hadn't heard it in years, you know, living in Manhattan. So, um, yeah. So I guess my journey was about just being, developing, kind of meditating every day, being super healthy. Um, you know, I started practicing Ayurveda and I went to an Ayurvedic ashram and just started eating in a way that was a little, just a lot more, I think nourishing than how I'd eaten in New York. Um, So, I mean, I love a New York slice, but I was just more mindful about my diet and eating like kind of fresh food and of course Indian food. So delicious. And even in Sicily, everything was just from the earth. You know, I think we get a lot of processed Mm -hmm. food in the U S and so I think that was also part of my spiritual journey because I was focused on my physical well being, which, you know, I think you need to focus on physical, spiritual, emotional, mental, all at the same time. Right. And that was just one aspect of it. Hmm. But, um, 
Yeah. So there's one uh, other thing that you said. You said the act of slowing down made me aware of a terrible habit of mine. I was nearly constantly chasing, reaching, and yearning for ever looking at what was next. And I don't think that that is an isolate that's isolated to you. I think that that is all of us, right? Like you write a book and your thought is, okay, why is it not selling more copies? Or how am I going to get the next book deal? Uh, it's always about the next accolade. Like we're stuck on this sort of hedonic treadmill. And I mean, have you been able to mitigate that? Like, what did you do to, to, um, to, to deal with that? Yeah. Um, I think I'm so much better. I think that when you live in a busy city environment, it kind of, it, I don't know, it kind of makes you that way. It's just that energy, like I think in New York city and everybody's like, go, go, go. And, um, I think I'm in Washington DC right now. I actually live just in the suburbs. Like right now, my views of like a beautiful forest, I, I think I've slowed down and that's what I wanted to do. And I'm a mom now. So I have like a six week old baby she smiled for the first time two days ago. It's like, I want to really, and kids are amazing at bringing us back into the moment. Like, cause all that really matters is her. That's like how I live right now. It's like, um, this beautiful being that I'm so not solely responsible for, but for the most part during the day. And it's like, um, I just think I've gotten so much better. I have, um, a neighbor down the hallway who has a two month old. And sometimes we go for like a walk in the park nearby, but I notice she's like a lawyer and she's, very, you know, she's used to working like nine to nine. And I think she's getting really restless and she can't wait for her maternity leave to go, um, to be up so she can go back and just, you know, pound the pavement or whatever she does. And I noticed that when we walk, she just wants to walk really fast and she wants to walk really far. And I just like, I find myself really like leisurely strolling and I just, I'm like, wow, I'm so different. Of course, she's like 10 years younger. It could be age, you know, I could be just old and tired, but, um, mm -hmm. I just, I just don't feel like I'm chasing anymore. I mean, we have like dreams that we talk about, like where are we going next year for vacation? But, but I don't feel, I feel like I've done everything that I always wanted to do in my life. I know that sounds crazy, but like I always wanted to write a book. So I did that. Yeah. I always wanted to have a baby. I did that. And I'm like, you know, I've done everything. So that's why I feel like I'll be a great mom. I hope at least, cause I feel like I can be a hundred percent focused on like her and what she wants and well, you know, of course you're not, you're supposed to also have your own life, which I will have, but you know, I just don't feel like there's anything that I haven't done. So to answer your question, I don't feel like, I don't know. I don't feel this frenzy to accomplish anymore. Yeah. Well, it, you know, I think that, uh, it's, it's kind of amazing. There are two other things. I remember there was the marrying yourself bit, which I thought was hysterical. And then, I mean, you even floated the idea of having a baby without, without a partner to your mother, right? Yes. Yeah. And I mean, I thought about that for a long time. I was really conflicted because I was like in this in-between space and I'm very indecisive. That's like one of the worst things about me. I, I don't make decisions easily and well. <laughs> I'm like, um, I always like question everything. Um, and I, I was like, on sperm donor, sperm donor websites, I was looking at the Scandinavian websites. My mom's like, you should have a Viking donor. I mean, she'd come around to it, um, <laughs> yeah. her, you know, cause she knew ultimately, you know, she loves me so much and she knew I wanted a baby so badly that she just wanted to support whatever would make me happy. And so she was like, let's do it. It's fine. Let's do it. But I, I think what held me back, it was great to have that support, but it was, um, that my dad had been such a pivotal figure in my life. And I just mm -hmm. couldn't see myself bringing a baby into the world without a father. And I think honestly, that was ultimately why I couldn't go forward with it. I think, yeah, I mean, it was just like, cause my dad was just like the love of my life. So, um, you know, and it's scary, it's scary to do something like have a baby on your own. I mean, women do it. I, I have a friend who's done it and she's amazing and women are amazing and they can multitask and, you know, it just, I think it would have been so, so hard, but ultimately my mom was supportive. And then I kind of, I guess I, I talk about surrendering a lot in the book and, you know, I was really focused on like eating healthy, feeding my body, getting out of New York city. And, um, you know, I talk about Gaia mother earth a lot in the book and how I feel like being in touch with nature again was so good for my body and my fertility that I got pregnant naturally at 41. And my baby's middle name is actually Gaia because I was so like, I felt like that was such an important, um, you know, aspect of my life during that year. 
because I wanted to kind of tribute it. Um, but yeah, so you asked me about the sperm donor and then, sorry, what was the yeah. other question? The marrying yourself. I, I think the part that I, I, I thought was really funny was where you mentioned being at an Indian wedding and somebody asked and you're like, yeah, I married myself. And you just got this like ridiculous look from probably some old Indian auntie who was like, what the hell? Yeah. They're like, you're crazy. But, um, yeah. you know, it's at a certain point, it's like, who cares what people think? I mean, I did it more as like, um, again, like just kind of a little ceremonial thing for myself. Cause it was like the end of my nine month journey. And I just felt like I'd really reconnect with myself in a deeper way. So, I mean, I didn't, you know, they actually, people do have self marriages and have parties and stuff like that, which, you know, I never was interested in. It's funny, yesterday, uh, you know, I bought, I was in Tanzania when I did that. And I bought this little kaftan for like 10 bucks. And, you know, I wear it to sleep. And I just like rolled out of bed yesterday and went, you know, when I went for a walk with the baby, I was just wearing that. And I was just thinking about, it. I'm like, oh my God, three years ago, I was like, on this beach in Zanzibar, like single, alone, childless. And it's just such a different, you know, such a different place that I'm in. Um, yeah. I still love that kaftan, but yeah, that was my wedding dress. That's what I was thinking. I'm like, they wear it as a pajama right now. <laughs> That's funny. So there's one other line that I remember underlining this and just thinking this was really funny because, you know, you said my brother tanned the darkest and I was always a little jealous of him for looking more Indian than I did. And he was the more exotic one, even though I think he was self-conscious about it. I accused my mother of loving my brother more because he was browner, closer to her skin tone. It sounds totally nuts, but that was how I felt, especially when we fought. I dyed my hair black and pierced my nose to look more Indian, but it didn't work. I was a composite byproduct of East and West. A mongrel, I was unidentifiable that way, not one or the other i just was and i i remember the when when your book was on on uh the table at my parents house my brother-in-law picked it up he's like who is this girl <laughs> you know this came up actually uh but I, I wanted to ask you about that because i i thought it was an interesting comment because of the fact that most people who are dark like avoid avoid the sun like the plague and i remember this because i i was when i was in india at the surf camp i met uh, a girl who was, you know, one of India's um, paddleboarding champions. And I asked her straight up, I said, why aren't more girls surfing here? And she said, because they're afraid they'll get dark because they're going to be out in the sun. It's just, uh, it's such a bad thing about that culture. Honestly. I mean, even yesterday I was like, Oh, I used to be, I was so much tanner last year at this time. Cause you know, I haven't been at the pool or anything. Right. Cause I, I can't take the baby out in the sun. My mom's like, no, 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 don't get darker. You're already too dark. <laughs> This is last night at dinner. I was like, oh my God. But you know, I don't try to change people. I mean, I that mindset yeah. is crazy. When you go to India, you've got these lightning tumor creams and all that stuff. But I, that's where I realize I'm very American because I'm like, oh, I love being tanner. The darker, the better. Um, yeah. But but yeah, I, when I was younger, I, I, I always loved being half Indian. I always thought it was the thing that made me kind of different. Um, I, it was exotic. I mean, there were not that many there weren't that many mixed marriages, I think in the seventies. So most people were like, I went to a largely Jewish school, I guess when I was, you know, my middle school, et cetera. So, and then my high school was very kind of white Protestant. Um, so I just always felt like that little, like, you know, that was just exotic being half Indian. And, um, I always wanted it to, to look more Indian, but I never felt like it did you know, have that dark, mm. long, luscious hair. My hair is like lighter, like my dad's or to have like, you know, darker skin or, you know, I pierced my nose and, uh, but it just did, it looked weird on me and it was, you know, so I took it out and I did a lot of things. I dyed my hair black, but I looked weird. So I just never looked Indian enough. And now of course I'm just like fine with the way I look. But <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is funny that I was like jealous of his darkness. Oh, it's funny because my sister doesn't, you know, if you saw her, you would potentially mistake her for Persian because she's incredibly fair. And that's the first comment that everybody had made about her. And I remember the summer I started surfing, every time one of my mom's friends saw me, they would say, wow, you've gotten so dark. And I told my mom, I was like, is it okay if I say, damn, you've aged a lot since I last saw you? She's like, no, don't say that. That's and I was like, yeah, but it's almost as inappropriate as me saying, wow, you've gained a lot of weight. But, you know, you I know. feel like that's an Indian thing, too. Like, they just, there's, like, sometimes no filter. Like, oh, you've put yeah, out. there's no like, etiquette. You're fat. <laughs> like, like there, there's no, it's kind of, like, refreshing because you know what they're thinking. But, yeah, there's yeah. no that decorum. I mean, uh, honestly, it's, like, you know, but, yeah. No, it's kind of unacceptable at the same time. It's, like, do you, you know. Yeah, yeah someone said to my mom the other day, like, another Indian friend, I was, like, you've aged a lot. 
I'm like, why would you say that to her? You know? And so it was really <laughs> upsetting to her. I mean, she actually wouldn't, that, that, in that sense, I think she's very Americanized. I mean, she wouldn't actually say yeah. that to anybody, you know, maybe behind their back. But, um, yeah. But yeah. Well, so I want to bring us full circle with, um, you know, this is where I kind of want to bring a conversation because I think this really was indicative of, of really in a lot of ways um, how the some of what you've, you've really identified in the book and, you know, sort of this idea. You said that no matter how self-governing and strong you are, no matter no matter that you don't need anyone ever for anything because you're self-sufficient, economically independent, multitasking powerhouse, there is still that annoying, undeniable, irrepressible, instinctive human craving for companionship and acceptance by another in the form of a relationship, another person to witness your life as it unfolds, to be invested in your success just as much as you are. And so I wonder how you live with the dichotomy of that being true and at the same time being satisfied with your life. Yeah. Well, I mean, I th- what, the first thing that came to mind when you re- read that sentence back to me, I was like thinking about my 40th birthday and how I kind of like had no one really, I mean, I had a million friends, but I had no one really like who had taken on the task of planning something. So I was like, I I have to do something to commemorate my being on the planet 40 years and surviving. And, you know, I just remember being like, God, I really wish I had someone to like plan something or throw a party or, you know, to go somewhere with. And, you know, I just felt really lonely. I think turning 40 was really hard. I think, you know, turning 30, 40, 50, I think they're probably just, they're just big ages. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, Mm -hmm. I just need to get through it. Once I was through it, I was totally fine, but there's all this like pressure around it. And of course, I can relate. That was my worst birthday ever. Uh, Yeah. I got dumped two weeks before. And all that. I was like, Oh my God, my eggs are going to go. And, you know, I just had all this anxiety that around it. And, so, but I, I mean, I had, I, yes, I, I agree with that statement that I wrote and now I am, an, I do have a companion. Um, so it's almost like I don't remember that loneliness that I felt, but at the end of the book, I really, I felt this wholeness. In fact, when I met my partner, I had filled up my life so much with so much amazing stuff that I actually didn't really have space for him. I was like, well, I've got mm-hmm. meditation on Wednesday. I've got this, I've got that. I've got the, you know, I had so much going on between my career and all my like extra career, curricular interests. And then my friendships, um, you know, I was like, well, I can squeeze you in on Saturday. My mom was like, Oh my God, what are you doing? You know, he was like <laughs> bringing flowers around and love notes and stuff. I'm like, well, I'm pretty busy right now, but you know, so I had been, yeah. I was so, I had created a life that I, I was so happy with and satisfied with. And I had read this somewhere in some book and I might've been getting to commitment. I can't remember, but like, it was like, create the life that you, it would be very hard for you to, you know, to see it being, to want to change it for someone else, Mm -hmm. right? So create a life that you love so much that you don't feel that kind of void. And so that's what I had created. So I didn't feel like I was like longing for a companion right before I met him. Um, I was really, I'd just been in um, upstate New York at this ashram that I like called Ananda Ashram. It's just in Monroe. It's like 30 minutes outside of the city. And I just did an Ayurveda retreat and I was just like, I just felt like I was so on my path and like I was bitten by a tick and that's actually how I met him. He's a doctor. And, Mm -hmm. uh, I went to see anyway, so long story, but I, but I was really in a place where I, I stopped looking and it was so, uh, liberating not to search, you know, because then it's when you give up that you meet someone, of course, everyone tells you that, but you're like, ah, you know, until I really, really gave up which I had, I was like, you know what? I, I, my life is really rich right now. It's fine. I'm good. And if I really wanted to have the baby, I would have done it on my own. Right. So I kind of come to, you know, accepted all of that. And then of course I met him and then like, it's actually kind of easy to get pregnant in your forties because <laughs> it happened right away. Or I was maybe lucky. Um, yeah. Amazing. Um, well, this has been really, really uh, eye-opening, insightful, thought-provoking, everything I thought it would be having uh, read the book. So I want to finish with my last question, which is how we finish all of our interviews here. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Yeah, um, unmistakable. Um, I don't know. I think someone who lives lives his or her life with courage, the courage you know, to be truthful. Yeah. A truth teller. 
Sorry, maybe uh, I didn't answer that right. I, I <laughs> no, 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 there's no wrong answer to the question. Uh, I just respect people who are courageous and yeah. daring. So that's what I think about. But awesome. um, thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Um, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us and share your story and your insights with our listeners. Where can people find out more about you, your work, the book, and everything that you're up to? Um, yes. Um, I have a website, www.natashascripture.com. And I'm on Twitter at NatScript and also on Instagram at Natasha Scripture. Um, and the book is called Man Fast, a memoir, and it's on Amazon, US and UK. There's two different versions, one a different version for the UK, but um, the US version is the newer version that came out on June 1st. And yeah, and I'm all, I also have a Facebook author page that's just under my name. So I'd love for people to get in touch. And I'm so glad that you loved the book and I would love for you to tell me how your journey goes in India <laughs> and uh, maybe you can write the sequel to the book woman fast. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe. And for everybody listening, we'll wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the unmistakable creative podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared.